In this video, I want to do some more computations of inverse functions, uh, algebraically speaking. Consider the function f of x is given as 2 over x minus 3, and we add to that 4. The basic strategy is going to be the same. We start off with the relationship that gives the function f. We're going to replace the f of x with a y here, y equals 2 over x minus 3 plus 4. And then we proceed to swap the roles of y and x in that formula, and this will give us a formula for f inverse. We're going to get x equals 2 over y minus 3 plus 4. And now we're going to proceed to do inverse operations until we can successfully solve for the y all by itself. Uh, so the first thing we do, kind of reversing of order of operations, we're going to minus 4 from both sides. That cancels the 4 on the left-hand side, and that would give us 2 over y minus 3 is equal to x minus 4. Um, now the left-hand side is just a fraction, right? Uh, we want to get rid of the y from the denominator. We have to kind of free it from its prison. It's trapped inside of the fraction right there. One can accomplish that by a couple different techniques. In this situation, I'm going to kind of treat the, the x minus 4 as a fraction, x minus 4 over 1. That way I can cross multiply. You multiply the 1 by the 2, and you're going to multiply the y minus 3 by the x minus 4. And if we do that, that'll then give us 2 times 1 is equal to x minus 4 times y minus 3, like so. And so 2 times 1 is pretty simple here. Now, one has to be kind of careful on the, on the next part, right? What we don't want to do, what we don't want to do is start spreading out the y's too far, right? So it might be tempting to like foil out the, the right-hand side. So you take x times y, x times negative 3, 4 times y, 4 times 3 there. The problem why that's with that approach is you get an xy, you'll get a minus 3x, you'll get a minus 4y, and then you get a plus 12. This is problematic for us because now there are two y's inside of the equation. We want one y, right? We want it y equals. So spreading out the y's is not going to help us. We want to keep them gathered in. So instead of foiling the right-hand side, because our goal is to solve for this y right here, instead, look at the expression x minus 4 and pretend like that's the coefficient of this expression right here, y minus 3. Divide both sides by x minus 4. And you have to do that to the other side as well, x minus 4. Then you'll see that the, the y, you'll get a y minus 3 from the, from the right-hand side. Then you get 2 over x minus 4. Whoops, minus 4 like so. And now in this situation, you'll notice we still have y all by its, I mean, y is all connected together. We still got to get rid of this stuff that's attached to the y. Uh, that's pretty simple. Just add 3 to both sides. And we end up with, in the final form, y equals 2 over x minus 4 plus 3. And so now that we solve for y, we're going to get rid of the y and put back in the name of the function. This is f inverse of x, uh, which we have this thing right here. And you might be tempted, like, well, should I add the fractions together, like 2 over x minus 4 plus 3? You could, but, I mean, we should do it for a reason. We shouldn't just do something because we think we ought to. There should be a reason motivating why we do it. Uh, and so, for example, like we had that choice between foiling this side or dividing by x minus 4. And we actually took a moment and stopped to think about what will happen if we do that. There are consequences to doing things to the equation. Foiling actually caused us to get farther away from solving for y as opposed to division. So we don't do things just to do them. We do them to make things better, right? To make to make things more, uh, to better. We'll just, we'll just keep with that. We'll make things better. Um, so I'm actually perfectly happy with writing the function in this form because in this form, I can very well see the transformations. You shift it up by three, you vertically stretched it by two, and you shifted it to the right by four. If I would start adding the fractions together, the graph transformations would be concealed. Let's take a look at another uh, algebraic function. This, these things right here, you have a fraction of a polynomial, of, uh, so you have polynomial top, polynomial bottom. Uh, th this is what we call a rational function. This type of rational function where you have a linear, a linear polynomial on top and a linear polynomial on bottom, this is often what we call a linear fractional. Um, and it turns out that linear fractionals are one-to-one -one functions, and we can solve for this thing algebraically. And, and there's kind of two ways one could do it. 
One, you could actually do a little bit of polynomial division. Um, like you could take this 2x plus 1 and divide it by, sorry, 2x plus 1, and you divide it by x minus 1. If you do that, you'll actually get something that looks very much like this function right here. Uh, in which case, then you could find its inverse the way we did just a moment ago. Uh, that adds a little bit extra flavor. You know, sometimes it's a little bit more spicy than we want it to be. And we haven't really talked about division, so we're not going to do that right now. Uh, but instead, let's let's just uh, try the approach we've done so far. Replace the f of x with a y. You get 2x plus 1 over x minus 1. Um, and so then when you switch to the inverse function, you're going to every y becomes an x and every x becomes a y. And something different happens this time. Uh, we end up with actually multiple y's in the equation. There's a y in the numerator and a y in the denominator. This is actually the situation we were trying to avoid in the previous example. This might be one advantage of doing polynomial division. Um, we, we actually would only have, by doing the division, you're actually only going to get one x to start with as opposed to two. Uh, but like I said, there's a price to paying division, and the price isn't necessarily worth it considering what we have to do now. So our goal is we want to solve for y, but first, to solve for y, we have to combine the y's. We want to combine the y's together. And what we're going to do is we have to free the y's from prison. It's like we have uh, two members of the family that are separated by war. A wall has now tr tr kept one in one land and the other in, in the other, so they have to break free. In order to do that, we need to liberate y from its prison, which we call the denominator, for which we're going to multiply the right-hand side by y minus 1, because multiplying by y minus 1 will cancel the division by my y minus 1. But what's good for the goose is good for the gander. We have to do the same thing to the left-hand side so that equality is preserved. This then will give us 2y plus 1 equals x times y minus 1. Now we're in a slightly different predicament than we were a moment ago. In this situation, we have a y imprisoned, right, inside of these parentheses here. Uh, the, the guard keeper, of course, is the multiplication by x. Previously, I told you not to multiply it out because that would spread out the y's. On the other hand, though, since the y's are already spread out, in order to combine them together, we need to liberate them and that's gonna only gonna happen if we distribute the x. It almost seems like I'm giving you different advice. In one situation, I told you not to multiply it out, but in a different situation, I told you to multiply it out. Why this, the, the important difference? Well, again, it, the, the point is on how we, we, we do things not because we're told to, because there's a reason for it. We didn't do it earlier because it spread out the y's. In this situation, since the y's are already spread out, in order to gather them together, we have to free all of them. So I would actually advise we multiply out the x. You get xy minus x is equal to 2y plus 1. You'll now notice that with all of the walls gone, our y's are free to be reunited. They can go back to their, their missing family member, right? And so we have a xy on the right-hand side. What if we subtract 2y from both sides? That'll put all of the y's back together. And what if we add x to both sides. That way, we put all of the multiples of y on the right-hand side, and everyone who's not a multiple of y will be on the left-hand side. Uh, the two y's will cancel, the x's will cancel on the right-hand side. This then gives x plus 1 on the left-hand side, and this will give xy minus 2y on the right-hand side. Now, if I was giving you something like 5x minus x, what would you do with something like that? Well, you'd be like, I'll combine like terms, in which case you would get 4x. But why is it 4x? Um, why isn't it 5x, 5 times 1? Why do you, or why isn't it, uh, you know, why isn't it 7? You know, why, why did you get a 4 right there? And when you're probably like, well, okay, you have a 5 right here, you have a negative 1 right here, you add together the coefficients. And let me give you some explanation of why that's what we do. You'll notice with 5x and with x, there's a common divisor, we call it the GCD, the greatest common divisor. There's a common divisor of x, and so we can factor out that common x, which would then leave behind a 5 minus 1 times x. Notice if I redistribute the x through, um, you'll get 5x minus x. Factoring is just the opposite of distribution. You just pull out the thing that was multiplied beforehand. And then you can see that once you have 5 minus 1 times x, that'll then become a 4x. Why am I mentioning that right now? Well, because we're actually in the same situation when you look at this right here. There's a y, there's a y. If you have x, y minus 2y, how do you combine those together? 
add together their coefficients, which is the same thing as just factoring out the y. Uh, factor out the y, you're going to end up with an x minus 2 times y. Now look at your equation. The left-hand side is currently x plus 1. The right-hand side is currently x minus 2 times y. You'll notice that there's only one y in the equation now. Hooray! We have now solved for y. We combined the y's together. That's our first objective. Uh, the next part is then, once you have the y's together, now you're going to isolate the y. That is, you want to get everything away from the y. Now, the thing attached to the y is, is an x minus 2, and it's attached to y via multiplication. So we perform the inverse operation, which is division here. So the x minus 2's will cancel, and then you're going to get y equals x plus 1 over x minus 2. And this would be the inverse, the inverse function of this linear fraction right here. That, that might seem quite intense, right? It, it seems like there might be a lot going on there. But it turns out... Um, it turns out that we have all of, uh, all of the skills in front of us to do these type of calculations. Uh, like if we go on to, if we look at the next example here, we have another function, f of x equals 4x minus 1 over 2x plus 3. I can promise you that this calculation is actually quite methodical. You do all the same steps each and every time, although, you know, the numbers change a little bit. So compare this example to the previous one. The relationship for y is going to equal y equals 4x minus 1 over 2x plus 3. Switch the roles of x and y as you transition to the inverse relationship. You get x equals 4y minus 1 over 2y plus 3. Multiply both sides of the equation by 2y, whoops, 2y plus 3. What's good for the goose is good for the gander, so that this cancels on the left-hand side. You then get x times 2y plus 3 is equal to 4y minus 1. So step 1, switch x and y. Step 2, clear the denominator. Step 3, distribute the x uh, that is on the left-hand side there. You get 2xy plus 3x equals 4y minus 1. Now you're going to gather all of the y's on the left-hand side. You're going to put everyone who's not a multiple y on the right-hand side. You end up with 2 2xy minus 4y on the left, and on the right you have a negative 1 minus 3x. On the left-hand side, factor out the y. Since you put every multiple of y on the left-hand side, there will be a common factor of y. Factor it out. You get y times 2x minus 4. This equals the right-hand side, negative 1 minus 3x. And whatever was left over when you factor out the y's, divide by it. 2x minus 4 divided by 2x minus 4. That'll cancel, and now you will have the inverse function, f inverse of x is equal to uh, negative 1 minus 3x over 2x minus 4. See, we got, we got all of the things we needed to do just right then and there. Um, the steps are the same every single time for these linear fractionals. They seem a little involved, but if we're intentional, if we focus on the algebraic steps and more importantly, why we are doing the algebraic steps, we can change the numbers and follow the same process. This is sort of the beauty of algebra. If we can focus on what's essential and we can ignore what's non-essential, what's irrelevant, then we can repeat the process over and over and over again. And that's really what algebra is all about. Focusing on the important things and ignoring the irrelevant things. And that's exactly how we can solve for an inverse function for one of these linear fractionals.